Three Plus You, as you know, is a community show, but at the heart of every community is family. And no matter what your family looks like, we hope that you celebrate it, love it, and embrace it. But we have had a chance this morning to venture over to Lee University in Cleveland to talk for a minute with Brad Wilcox, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. Thanks so much for sharing your time. Thanks for having me today. We've snagged you because right. you're actually here for a symposium happening right. for faculty um, from all across, really, this part of Tennessee Right. who want to hear from you. The study of the family and how to keep it strong right. is your passion. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, I'm talking today about kind of this idea that I think we often think about when it comes to some of our biggest issues like the health of the American dream, incarceration, depression among our adolescents. We think about issues like race or poverty or education as being the issues you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of our kids. But what we're seeing in the research is that it's often the case that kind of both the sort of the stability and quality of family life ends up being kind of the number one factor. So I'll be talking today about, you know, how strong and stable families are so important for our kids. And you don't want to tap dance around what your research sure. has shown you sure. to be right. true. So when I said that you want to celebrate family, whatever it looks like, you yourself came right. from a single parent home. Correct. Right. So you know that you can grow up sure. quite well with that, but it's not always ideal. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I you know, I did fine in school and graduate Clearly. school and everything else. But um, I also kind of study the family as a sociologist. And what you see kind of from the research perspective is that kids are more likely to flourish when their parents can keep things together, when they can remain stably married. And also communities tend to be stronger when there are more stable families in, in the neighborhood and in the larger community. So sure. um, look at things, for instance, like you know mass incarceration. It turns out kind of the number one predictor of mass incarceration at the neighborhood level is the number of single parent families in a community. Um, or if you think about the health of the American dream, kind of kids going from rags uh, to riches as adults, the, again, the number one predictor that Raj Chetty at Harvard has found is the share of single parent families uh, in a community. So these are kind of just two indicators of the ways in which we're seeing in the research that um, stable families are pretty important for kids and for communities. But of course, it's also the case too that having you know, a stronger marriage also matters for both for adults and for kids as well. That's what I love about the messaging you bring because you're not wanting to quote guilt parents into saying, you know, stay married for the sake of your kids. You're saying stay married for the sake of you. If it's a salvageable marriage, you'll benefit in the end. Right, so I mean, we have to be careful here. So I would certainly say to, you know, most, I think, married couples, I mean, I've been married 27 years, I think you have as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certainly chapters in your marriage when there's disappointment, when there's anger, you know, frustration, mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of part and parcel of married life. Um, and recognizing that kind of like from the kid's perspective, if mom and dad are not particularly healthy, sort of happy, well, that's okay. <laughs> They're happy to sort of be in the same home, to be with their right. with their parents. So it's, I think, in terms of like the outcomes we'd be concerned about in terms of like marriage would be, you know, with domestic violence. That would be kind of a different kind of situation. But right. today, a lot of marriages end just because one spouse is sort of feeling, you know, like there's a new person in their life, or they're kind of feeling like you know, their spouse is not as emotionally attentive to them as they mm -hmm. wish that they were. And so in those kinds of scenarios, what I'm sort of seeing from the research is it'd be better for the kids if the parents could kind of find a way to stay together and to renew their marriage. That's sort of the marital quality point. You know how we talk about, in, with children especially, that they need this kind of instant gratification. Sure. They've grown up around that world now. And all right. of us, adults too, have reached that point that it seems like sometimes you're not always quick to look at something and examine, if I take this choice, what's the right. consequence going to be? Sure. Does that, do you think, factor in? Yeah, I think people are expecting, you know, um, oftentimes their marriage to kind of conform to what I call kind of the soulmate myth. Mm -hmm. That is kind of the, the butterflies are still there. There's kind of that intense emotional connection. The swooning. Yeah, the swooning. <laughs> um, and, and the fact is, it's just, you know, in any kind of long-term relationship, there are going to be, you know, ebbs and flows. And realizing that there are times when you're at the bottom part of that of that curve right. and you know um, that it's better to stick with it both for you know your sort of your, your spouse's well-being and, and for your kids well-being and just kind of to have that strong and stable family for the longer term. Is, you is were telling me, I asked you off camera, if it's true, because you hear it, that the divorce rate is dwindling. And you said right. you hope that that's a 
factual statistic, right, right. but it's still kind of too early to tell. Yeah, we have seen the actual divorce rate come down since 1980. You know, there was this big surge in divorce in the late 60s and in the 70s. It was kind of like the divorce decade. Mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing since 1980 the divorce rate come down. But the big question we have as scholars is, are people kind of just basically postponing divorce or are they actually steering clear of divorce? And on that score, we haven't kind of reached a definitive conclusion about what's happening. We, we do see, obviously, in the news, you know, um, you know, some long-term couples facing marital trouble, you know, um, like Tom Brady and Giselle. So, you know, the question is, is that sort of pattern one that we're going to sort of see replicated at, at sort of the national level? You uh, have done some studies, too, on faith. Uh, whatever your faith sure. may be, right. and that like in all things with the marriage, the more common ground the couple has, the sure. stronger. So where your faith can be right. shared and right. shown to share, mm -hmm. that's beneficial? Right. Yeah, so kind of in terms of thinking about, you know, some things, you know, on the more optimistic note or more hopeful note, there are certainly things that couples can do together, you know, that'll boost their odds of being both not just stably married, but also happily married. Mm -hmm. And one of those things that we see is certainly going to church together, for instance, or praying together. Um, these are very strong predictors of being more stably married. So for instance, couples that kind of go to church together, about 40% less likely to get divorced. And as that's I kind a of, lot, that's a big yeah, that's statistic. A, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big story. Um, but they're also more likely to be happily married. Um, when it comes to marital quality, though, I found that actually praying together as a couple, kind of taking that time, maybe in the evening, just you know, on your own, is uh, particularly actually predictive of higher quality marriages. And I think there's something about prayer in terms of like being able to kind of um, understand what's happening in your wife or your husband's life, um, expressing concern for them, um, but also being able to kind of forge new patterns. If there are kind of patterns in your life, in your marriage or in your family that are, you know, um, you know, more, more, more yeah. difficult or, 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 you know, dysfunctional, you can maybe sort of see your way to sort of forging a new path. You know, that's interesting you touched on that with the nature of prayer, because the very idea of it is you may have your own personal prayer, but often it is, please help such and so, which sure. means you do have to know that need. Right. And so that kind of goes back to that original mm -hmm. desire when you fall in love with somebody right. is you want them to come first. Right. And I think there, I mean, you know, I would sort of say having an overly soulmate view of marriage is problematic because it can kind of inflate your expectations too high of what you can sort of achieve in your relationship. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Marriage is in part about a kind of communion um, that's, you know, about a friendship and about emotional connections as well. And so prayer is one way of experiencing that communion, but also we see in the research that things like, you know, on a more secular side, like having a regular date night, you know, so making an effort to go out once a week with your spouse, you know, and it could be, you know, obviously dinner and a movie or just dinner, for instance. Um, but even more kind of doing things that are a little bit unusual, kind of mixing things up, um, seems to that novelty ends up being really kind of valuable for couples um, mm -hmm. in kind of keeping that, that sort of romantic spark alive more. So that's sort of something that you can do in a kind of intentional way to, um, you know, to sort of protect your marriage as you get older. What else can you do? Because if you, when you're raising your children, you remember this, that date night could be ordered in pizza, but sure. you're asleep by 8.30. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, I think obviously another kind of really important thing to sort of bear in mind in all of us is just sort of like, you are your friends, you know, you really are your friends. Um, and um, what we see in the research is that if your friends' marriages are relatively strong, um, yours is going to be relatively strong. Whereas if your friends are getting divorced or they have been divorced um, or they're not kind of focus as much on their families, um, you're likely to be kind of doing the same thing. You know, birds of a feather flock together. So I think the bottom line here is just to be attentive too as you're kind of making friends across the course of your lives to sort of be seeking out people who are, who take their kids, you know, seriously, who take their marriage seriously. And if you do that, you know, that's going to be, um, that's going to have real implications for the quality of your own marriage. Too. How about communication? That's got to be a big one. Sure, and it's, it's important to note too that one of the things I'm writing about in this book for HarperCollins um, on marriage is just the way in which there are a lot of similarities between women and men, but there are also some differences. So for instance, I think particularly kind of early on, you know, many couples don't appreciate that in communication, um, women are often looking for kind of affirmation and looking for just um, a sense of being kind of emotionally present um, when they're articulating like a concern or you know a difficulty in their lives whereas husbands are more likely to try to fix it in, you know in that kind of situation mm -hmm. 
and to give advice, well, you could do this or that to sort of fix it. Okay, Go ahead. you are not a marriage counselor, Yeah. but does that explain why very often in people's kitchens across this country, sure. a woman will talk to her husband and she'll then, he'll be quiet. Right. And she'll probably say, are you hearing me? Sure. But he's not answering because he's trying to think of the solution. Sure. I think that's a pretty common dynamic. It is a very common dynamic. And I think too, like oftentimes when, when men are experiencing some kind of difficulty or challenge, they often kind of, they don't necessarily want to talk about it. They just kind of need some space, you know, to work it through in their own minds yeah. and then kind of circle back. So I think one of the challenges we see too is that couples have to recognize when it comes to communication is that women and men often are communicating in different ways and looking for different things. And if you can kind of can reach that realization that your wife is different than you are, your husband's different than you are on average, it makes it easier to navigate this, this difference. You look across the globe, all cultures, and marriage is at the root uh, of all strong families, so it makes a lot of sense. Thanks sure. for sharing your time. Thanks for having me on today. You gave us a teaser, so you are writing this book for right. Harper Collins. What's right. it called? It's and called Get it Married. <laughs> so, and it's coming out mid, sort of mid next year. Yeah. Thank you for the conversation.